Okay. Mr. Antonacci, first, how old are you? 86. And when was your birthday? April the 21st, 1925. Okay. You tell me when you're ready. Okay, give me just one second. One thing. I'm sorry. I'm ready. Are you ready? Uh-huh, yeah. Okay. Yeah, ready, so Today is September 24th, 2012, and we are interviewing Mr. Ernest Antonacci here at the Illinois State Library. Mr. Antonacci is 86 years old and he was born on April 21st in the year 1925. My name is Jill Heffernan and I'll be the interviewer. Mr. Antonacci, can you tell us for the recording what war and branch of service did you serve in? Infantry, Third Army. And that was in what war? Second World War. Second World War. And what was your rank? Uh, sergeant. As it starts out there, the last part of the sergeant, I started to, I was going as a PFC, then a corporal, and then a sergeant. And where was it that you served? It sits town, you mean? Yeah. Oh. <laughs> Stop the patient with me now. I don't know. I, I can't. One of those papers gave it every bit of it. I think there was an answer in there. Started out in Luxembourg. Some Luxembourg. You were all over Belgium, Europe. Belgium. Luxembourg, Belgium, France, Germany. A lot of different places. Okay. Um. I'm just going to go down this so it's easier. And what was your job? You were in the infantry. I went in, we, we went in to uh, Luxembourg, and that's when we got, we started in that combat. I was a machine gunner, and there was two machine gun nets per company, or an infantry company, and we were set up to go across, I forget it, it was the Sour River or one of the rivers that we were that I mentioned in my book. Uh, we were crossing that and I was trained in California as a, a communication man and I was the only communication person in the company. So the captain wanted me to run a uh, phone from one machine gun nest to the next machine gun nest and on my way back they were knocked out by 88 bombs from the Germans, and I was caught in the middle. So three of those other those other two were gone, so we had no more machine guns. So about three days later, the captain approached me and says, we got some new, new equipment. Do you want to go back to your machine gun squad, or do you want to be my uh, messenger? Um, I'll come up to him. It, a, I get that it says scout messenger. Yes. That's it. And I says, well, I'm thinking to myself, I know what happened to my last uh, crew. Says, I'll try that. Mm -hmm. Well, that's what I was from there on. A little with my communication experience, it worked in perfect because I went ahead of the, my company into enemy territory and phoned back by radio, in most cases, what I seen and where there's, there's Germans dug in at. Mm -hmm. And I dug in myself and waited until they came to me, my company. So that was it the way as the rest of the war. And so you were you were the lookout. I I guess that's what you call it. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. Because we were we were being picked off because they were already dug in and they they were they were going to fight. We were on their territory. Mm -hmm. So I think that that's what happened. So I uh, now that I look back on it, I wish I had stayed with my company because I would have had my buddies right with me. They all were good people. They're they're great. I had. I can't complain about any one of my, my friends that I had there, but they were, they weren't exactly close because I wasn't part of them. Mm -hmm. They were close together. 
But they always tell me they always had a pot of coffee every time I come back. The mom was always seeing them sweating, freezing, sweat. Mm -hmm. They'd have a cup of coffee for me. I mean, they, they, were, they, were, they treated me like one of them, but they were a, a blended together. They were molded. And that's the way they should be. Mm -hmm. But that was it. And that's one thing that I was disappointed in what my job was. But I got home, so I'm kind of happy. So in all of that, did you ever sustain any injuries? Well, not from uh, enemy territory, no, no. I got self-inflicted in energies, uh, things, yeah. Um, I had my hold and now we were under uh, mortar fire, and we were on the back end of a Jeep and had a coil of wire, and I was holding the wire with a fork from a tree, and I was trying to hold that in there, my right arm, right in here, got twisted on the square axle, and just chewed up my arm. Well, I go into the medics, and he puts my iodine on it, and wrapped it up there, and then the second time he had done it, pulled the skin back off, it was all dried, and he did it again. But I lived through it, so but that was earth shattering. And it, um, but that, basically, that was about the only one. It's not as bad as a gunshot wound. Oh, it was, after the war was over, pitch black, and I was, we already, well, that, I'm jumping way ahead because it says so in the book, but uh, you asked, how was I hurt? Well, some Germans caught me and they beat me up and left me for dead. And of course, I had, wasn't, you see, I'm here, and uh, I, did, I did fine. And uh, they, my guys took me to the field hospital and they, they bandaged me <coughs> up there. And, and one of the guys came and said, well, We're moving for, you know, tomorrow morning there. I just wanted you to know. I said, Well, I'm going to move with you then. So I, Signed myself out, mm -hmm. and I went with him. And I had myself all bandaged up there, and I had black eyes and broken, broken teeth. <coughs> and uh, well, it, that's that's what happens. And it, um, I was in the wrong place at the wrong time. Mm -hmm. How did you deal with the stress of being in Europe? Doing stress. The stress. I don't know what what the difference. I mean, you don't get immune to being afraid, but that's the stress I had. I mean, uh, everybody had the same stress. I mean, we were all uptight, you know. Mm -hmm. You hear a little noise and you're going to jump. Uh, it, it's not natural to be frightened, but the enemy is there. You're in enemy territory, and they're going to fight just like we would if they were here in the United States. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, I would hope that we would be able to fight that hard. Yeah. But they did. I, I don't know how I could add more to it, but it uh, was... I... Uh, I had a bunch of friends. I mean, they're all friends. They, they had, I mean, as I said, coffee or they had something. And when they get some package from home, they'd yell at me, get some cookies. I mean, it, it was just that kind of a friend, you know. It's, 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 of course, mom always sent something every day. She would always send something. We didn't get all of that, but we'd always get it all at once. And of course, then I had a lot of friends. Well, yeah. <laughs> Everybody was happy yeah. to see that. <laughs> but it's, uh, I'd say the, the girls here at home suffered more than we did. Okay, and tell me about how you did keep in track, keep in touch with your family. By mail, that's the only way. By letters, and I, I'd, I'd write down something even when we stopped and we were in a in a foxhole, and I jot it right <coughs> in my pocket there, and then tomorrow morning I put something else down. But I rarely mentioned anything about what was going on. Not because of, they said you can't give out military secrets. Well, there's no military secret getting shot at. I mean, it, uh, it's that's uh, done every day. You didn't want your family to worry. Pardon? You didn't want your family to worry. I did. Yeah, yeah. And I, I think that I read a, a letter. I wrote, I'd written letters that were, had a smile on it. And that was what I was trying to interpret. And of course, I had to write my wife Alice every day if I could. I wouldn't be able to mail it, maybe 30 days later, I'd be able to mail this thing there. And I'd only get a light there, and then sometimes it's all muddy and all stuff together. And, and I'd scrape it all off and put it in the envelope, and she would get it with all that mud. So I got part of I got Europe's uh, in my mailbox at home. I brought part of uh, Europe with me. <laughs> so, I mean, that's the only way I gotta say, because some of the letters still got mud on it. <laughs> sure. Um, okay, the other question I have is, what was the food like for you while you were in the service? Well, from poor to lousy. <laughs> when it was poor, it was great. <laughs> but we, we, we did, we get to pull back to, we leapfrogged 
one one division would jump and then we'd pull back. We'd stay there and they'd leapfrog and going that way. We went that way. Later in the war there, we did different strategy. Not my choice, the general's choice, but we different strategy. But most of it was until we got deep into uh, Germany, we leapfrogged. And we'd sit in place there while they, they went, we, we covered for them, and then they would cover for us. And so on, came on. Three divisions, or one one company, three companies to up. Yeah, three companies. And how many years were you there? I'm sorry? How many years did you serve? I served just uh, about a month short of three years, but then that was only from, uh, I went into action late. Oh, what was it? Oh, we were in Luxembourg. When we went in, oh, there's the stories I made my book doesn't tell. But we had our duffel bag. We came in from La Harve, and, and this book here, this book here shows with our, how we traveled. You're looking at your clock. No, it's fine. Uh, we had a it was a convent. And it looked like a, a, a old ancient castle. We went down a corridor. We had our duffel bag. We just got off off the ship. And we de this was in Luxembourg City. And we dropped our duffel bag in a, looked like a dungeon, and I went down a corridor and trying to go back to the company, and a nun came at me, and she dropped her head, and I walked right past and say a word there. But I don't know whether she's afraid of me, or just being, maybe they, they just couldn't talk or something. That was like my rules. Mm -hmm. But anyway, that, that's, that's the first thing that we had, and then when we went into action from that point on. That, uh, we were lucky. We didn't lose as many men as a lot of them did. But uh, well, I did lose two of them in my own crew. They hurt well the first day in, in action. So that's where I was decided. Well, I, I didn't want to be a machine gunner. I know what already happened to that. So I tried something else, mm -hmm. and, and it worked out because I I learned a lot from that, and I seen more than anybody else seen. And, and uh, I uh, I came out because I had a lot of good friends, and they were all. I, I can't complain about it. Even our officers were superior. Did you keep in touch with anyone from the service? Yes, for a long time. And all of a sudden, everybody got married and started having kids. And of course, then it fell apart. And, and occasionally, I get uh, made a, a Christmas card from one or two of them. But most of them are gone. I'm one of the lucky ones that lived on as far as I am. Well, after all, I'm almost 87. 87? I think I'm 87 or 86. Yeah, 87. I'll be 87 in April. Yeah. Okay, when you were in the service and you had a night off when you weren't fighting, what did you do for fun? Well, we had a lot of drilling here. We went straight to California, beautiful, beautiful camp, brand new camp. There was only one group before, and they was were, um, um, what's called a officer training school. And we said, wow, we really hit a high work up the officers. But they, we weren't. We were there at a communication school. And that's where I learned the communication. And, it, uh, and my, my uh, information to on uh, my record, what uh, was your favorite sport? Well, I put baseball and boxing. Well, that's what I did before I went in, boxing. And I put boxing. Well, of course, they called me in and said, would you represent the, comp the company in the the company or the grounds for for the company B five seven. Why not? I haven't had a better offer, so I did. And they the captain babied me. They go every Friday night they would go on a bivouac, which is about four miles out. This was in California. Mm -hmm. And they'd have to dig in and do their duty of becoming a soldier. He wouldn't let me go because I was afraid it rain I'd catch cold. That's a fact. I was out there once, and I see what they were doing, and it was fun, really. It was. He didn't want me to catch cold. So I said, I'm a baby to already. I wasn't even in there for a month yet. Okay. But I did. I fought six rounds of six fights there, and uh, he was happy with me, and, and I got the finest food. And, of course, when I couldn't go out with the guys, the cooks did their cooking in there and took it out to them, but I sat down with the cooks. And of course, we had steaks and all the good things that they didn't have. So there was an advantage to everything. So, but uh, and I, I enjoyed myself. It was just like a vacation, because it, and I I enjoyed the physical work because that was part of my deal. I mean, I was staying in shape, and I was for for a little guy, I, I was in good shape. 
When you got out of the service, did you go back to what you were doing before you left? Yes and no. I got married. And I wasn't married before. So uh, that's, that's what that. No, I, I, I did take a real estate class and I got my real estate license, sales license, and became a broker. And, and it um, worked out fine. And I was a builder. My dad was a builder. So it was a fall in. I built it and I was out through it selling real estate. At that time, real estate was selling good. What's your chance? Plus is minus. Right now, it's got its minuses. I mean, it's, it's, it's bad. And I'm, I'm re, right now, I'm redoing, at my age, I'm starting up another company. Oh, my goodness. And, and I'm having a good time doing it, but it's tough getting started because there is no money out there. I talked to FHA, the main office in Chicago, a couple of weeks ago. She was in tears, and I've talked to her, I don't know how many times, and she has a cheerful voice, just like you have there, and I can, I can picture her. I never did meet her personally, but the last time I called her, she says, we have no money. We have no money. And she was sniffing. I apologize for bothering her, and I hadn't called her since. Okay. So uh, it'll, it'll come around, but uh, it's kind of hard getting a new company started when there's so many people who are unemployed as it is. Mm -hmm. But I'll get the job done, because I've got a personal feeling and uh, I know it's going to work. So did the experiences that you had in, during the war, how did that form you as you were going through your life? How did it influence your thinking? Well, I loved Europe. We made two trips to Europe, my wife and I, and one time her mother went, her, yeah, her mother went with us. The other time, just the two of us. And we see all the capitals and such, and went to Rome, and I uh, even went to Germany. Oh, it was one that's in this book here. We crossed the Rhine River at Bobbert. St. Gore was a Lorelei, and back in the 14th century, they would hurt, they would, they, the sailors could hear the singing and lure them in, and they would capture them. And that's, that is. Fab fable, I'm sure, but it was, it's history. And I, otherwise, I wouldn't know about it. But we stopped at Bob, at that place to see St. Gore, and we were on a tour. But one more, one more, and I didn't know St. Gore was there. We were waiting to cross the Rhine River, and we were in Gore, a beautiful, quaint town. It looked like Hansel and Gretel decor, and just a beautiful place. You didn't see any civilians, but the, we had beds to sleep in. We'll see if somebody will go on. But it is a beautiful town. And uh, that's when I came back from Luxembourg. But before we got to Luxembourg, the captain sent a runner from the off his office, Colonel uh, uh, Corporal, wanted to know if I wanted to go to Luxembourg City for a rest camp. I said, Why don't you get somebody else? He said, No, the captain told me you. Well, all right, so I went. And I was there for a week. But the truck back then, if you ever seen these here, covered trucks there, army trucks there, there's full of everybody. At the one on the end, and I sat on the very end, and another sergeant came up, well, all right, who's in charge here? Nobody answered there. He said, all right, here, you take it. Well, when we got to Luxembourg City in a hotel, everyone was a, a lieutenant to a major. I was only private. And I was in charge. <laughs> I have a story to tell, but it was beautiful. I had my picture taken there in Luxembourg City, and it's in the book here that I had taken before we went back to Bopper on the Rhine River. So that's where we went. My, my office was at, at, they were waiting. They were there for four days, and we waited three more days, about seven days before we made the crossing. But we laid on the concrete walk. The German was on the east side. They had a concrete walk. They wave at us. We wave back, walking guard on our side. They were on their side of the river. And all of a sudden, we stop. We wave back. They wave back. And then, of course, then all things broke loose one night, and we were crossing. And when we got through, of course, the rest, the rest is history. But I thought that was a, it was nice. And I used to when I went back from my rest camp, I had a pack of letters about life back from my mom and Alice. That's how it's spoiled. And I knew it. And it worked. Because <laughs> I loved it. It's amazing. 
Yeah, so it was. But anyway, I lay on that hot concrete sidewalk with, with my dress, but it's hot. It was so warm, it was soaking up that heat, and it just, oh, I didn't fall back and take a nap. German's still on the other side, walking by right there, we'd be sleeping on this side. So that's hard to read. What is something that stands out in your memory that you'll never forget? Well, that's one of them. What else? Oh, oh, and I've got it in my book too there. I've I got a lot of little skippings of it. One I do want to say there, when we got to the Sea Green Line, there was a, a big tower there. It was, they called it, it's a cat's paw, is what they called it in our English, but it's, it, it was in German or something else, and I got it there too. It uh, had this five stories high, three stories down and two stories up. And we were, three of us, to go in there and see what was in there. Well, the front, the, the door was cracked open, so we pushed that open, and a room there looked, it looked like a basketball field. There was, there was nothing nothing in there, but it's that big. And so we went in there, so we started going downstairs, a little winding stairs there, and all of a sudden, we heard a noise, and that scared us, so we pushed back out. So it wasn't long after that, we uh, decided well, we better go back and several, several of my, my crew was in other companies that, that was attached to this to find out. In other words, I was still looking for something to tell the, 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 the mark captain. And we came across a meat market. And we walked in there and there was a big side of meat sitting on a chopping block there and stove, coal stove had some uh, ambers in it with charcoal. Well, this is, this is like home. And so one guy started soaking that thing up there, and, and one started, started cutting off some meat. And I said, hey, you let me do that. I learned from my uncle, Nick. He was a meat cutter. And so I started chopping off some steaks, and we did, and put them in there. And oh, that was, it was a little tough, but it was good. So then we decided we better, one of the guys said, well, you cut some up so we can take some home my, back to my buddies to my company. So we're sure. So we got chopped up a little chunk like that, so we go fast. And we went out, and of course, two of us went a different way. They went their way, and I went our way, and right at the curve of the corner, there was three horses dead on the, on the corner, one with the hindquarters cut out. I said, oh boy, you know what we had for our filet mignon. <laughs> That's it. We ate it because we didn't know that. We just thought it was a tough cow. Okay, the hindquarters on that horse. <laughs> so somebody was there before we were, the whole I know. <laughs> so that, that was it. So I, that, uh, that, that was a true story. So That would be very memorable to me, too. It was, too, yeah. Oh, my goodness. Does your company have any reunions? They used to, and I, I didn't know that they were for a long time until this book here. I'm not even mentioned in this book. This is about the reunions. This gives a route of everything we went. There's a route to get off of Laharb. Well, Laharb, I got to tell you that. It's just a quickie here. I know you're, you're in a hurry, too. Um, we got off of the bars of the Polish, Polish uh, ship. And it was the cleanest one in town, in town, you know, anywhere around. But we got there, and it just we got up as close as we could there. We had to walk in water, freezing, freezing, and we break the ice, you know, and we had our feet wet. It's, that got to the point where it was normal. So we had to unload ammo from that boat to a barn, which was about a block away, a city block. And we carried it that barn. Everybody grabbed hold of a box of hand grenades and went, went carrying to this barn here to stack it up in the shelves. Well, one of the shelves broke and hit one of our men. And he had to go to the medics. Lo and behold, he got credit for being the first one to get a purple heart in our company because he got hit with a hand grenade. So, and that is fact. So he's the first one that got a purple heart. <laughs> and he was angry. Oh Did you receive any medals? Pardon? Did you receive any medals? Did Was you get it? a purple heart or? No, I did not. I received some medals, but I didn't. Uh, as you see here with uh, what's his name right there was given me. My I didn't have any medals at all until he came by and got them for me. So he gave me a bronze star. So I mean. Because he proved that I had it. It's, it's, it's in the book there. You've got it there. So I got all of them. There was 
I can probably take care of the fact that they went home and died something. Oh, I should have said that. It's funny. Yeah. Oh, one more I got to tell you, and then maybe you can ask me questions. I don't remember what area we were in. We were walking through the forest, and they had beautiful forest because most of it was clean because all the ladies and grandmas would pick all the branches and remember they keep those forests clean because they needed it for cooking and heating. And it was clean. We came across this here beautiful little quaint cottage. It was right out of Hansel and Gretel. I mean, you just see it. If you ever remember the story of the Hansel and Gretel and the way the decor and the Thing is, and we we slept upstairs and some downstairs, and, and uh, there was there was only six of us right there. There was six of my crew. In other words, it built, we 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 I will get a couple more people to go with me. Well, anyway, uh, I pulled first guard, one man outside, and the other would be taking a nap. Well, if we were there, we were going to be there for one hour, so we were going to switch off at a good time. So I heard a noise. And I looked around there, and I heard another click. And of course, there I was. I looked up there. Yep, it was up there. I also looked up there. Somebody opened the door there and peed right in my face. Oh, no. On the second floor. Oh, I couldn't leave my guard station. <laughs> He's lucky. I, 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 if I ever thought anybody had any control, I had control because I, he would have been a dead man because I, I see the silhouette who he was. So when I got my turn to go back there, take a nap, while well, I washed my face with snow, fresh fallen snow, so that was good. Oh, but that's a true story. I mean, it isn't a, a nice one, but it's a true one. Bang, I got right in the face. But anyway, I went to the top and I knew right where he slept there in his bedroom, and I pushed him over to the stairs and I pushed him all the way down. He went, bump, 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 bump. He's like, what'd you do that for? It's because I wanted to. That's all. That's Dr. That's all. No more of that. That's all. <laughs> that, that's a true story, so bless my heart. <laughs> That's a really good I know, one. You can't tell too many good ones, and I'll be that one. I mean, I don't know, maybe a couple more that I might think of. But anyway. That's a really yeah. good one. So I don't know what else is in this thing besides the area that we made this year. will tell me the areas that I went to, well, from town to town to town. <clears throat> so, so tell me, okay, this is more personal. I want to know about your wife. My life. Yes, and and your wife. She wrote you every day. Yeah, she wrote. Me you day. wrote to her every you day. You enjoyed the war. Yes, yeah, during the war. Yeah. Well, it was normal, like everybody else had it. I mean, I I didn't have it any tougher than anybody else. But I got the point. I I was getting enjoying it. Maybe I don't know. I uh, I didn't want to because I've seen some of those guys enjoy it, and, and they went off their rocker. I mean, it just. Mistreat everybody, and, and uh, I, I couldn't, I couldn't handle that. I couldn't handle it. I think that's the saddest part of the whole thing, mm -hmm. because those poor wives and widows. It was the last Christmas that I was there. I had to run. I put a hook up a new um, telephone station. And I forget what town it is. I, this year tells it, but anyway, I had to go by a church. And it was black. I went by there, and I said, well, I, I can't find any more wire there, because I was supposed to find the wire that's already there, because it's short out. I got to look up a, a, a station over here at this building here on my map. So I left my material there, and I started back there, and there was music in the church. There was, was children practicing choir, Christmas carols, and it just struck me. I leaned up against a tree and just listened to them, and it was just it was below freezing, and I was I was shivering, I was wet, but their songs were just so so strong, beautiful. I mean, it, uh, I cried then too. The tears were coming down my cheek. I trying to think about it. I do think about that often. But this was Christmas time. But those little voices, and I thought, those children are the biggest, bravest people we've got. All the children there were brave. They had to go through so much, and they didn't know why. And our mothers and our grandmothers and our wives and girlfriends worked at, the, at ammo places and building that 12 hours a day. They were suffering. They had children. They had boys and girls in the service. They suffered. Why? But they did. And we, we overcame it just because of war. So they had the girls and the the ladies that left behind are the true heroes of this whole entire Second World War. 
mothers particularly. I mean, it, it, was, it was hard. It, it was, well, I cried, so that's what be tough. But I'm a, I'm a sissy. Was that? Yeah, uh, it, uh, that, that was one of the most brilliant because that, that music, which the, the words was not Silent Night, Holy Night, and all of this, but it was in German, you know. But the music told me what it was, and I, I sang well along with them, my, my tone there. And I said, I know it's over an hour that I was there, but then I had to get back, and I was, well, I'm freezing right there, so. But anyway, it, it, uh, it all came out fine. Did you have anything with you that you took and carried, like a good luck charm, anything like that that you held on to? Would you ask me that? My rosary. That did it help you through some really hard times? Pardon? Did it help you through some really sure hard times? sure did. Oh, yes. I had that, well, I have to tell you, I had that in my hand almost all the time in my glove on my left hand because I, I did this with my trigger finger. But I do this here and that will be safe. I think it might not be. I might have been saved anyway, but you got to have faith someplace. But I still have that rosary. In fact, I gave it to my daughter about two, three or four years ago. I put it in a little plaque there and put it on the wall there. And it had three beads missing, and, and Jesus was off the cross, and the cross was bent. And it, uh, it was, I think that's what brought me home. But anyway, uh, that, that, besides that, uh, something. I want to say about that, um, something pertaining to that. But I mean, basically, that's what it was. And I, uh, oh, one of those holes. Oh, I came. I came back from a. a, a see, I can't find my words. From looking out in enemy land, and I went to my my uh, company, and one of the guys next, right next to me, said, "Why don't you take that?" Uh, Foxhole right there. It's already dug. The Germans dug that one. And I said, well, that's as good because the ground is frozen. And I couldn't do anything better for it. And uh, I looked down in there, water freezing. I pushed my, my spade did down in there and I broke the ice. And then I put my helmet down and bailed out the ice of the water. And I got down in mud and I started shoveling the mud and I dug a little hole from the one side to the drain there. And I sat in there. I got all curled up. And I almost certainly got there and I thought I was going to fall asleep and I heard music. And this is true. Across my heart. Because something like that would not. It was like a, a organ music. In other words, a, like it's something out of heaven. I mean, it's just it's so pleasant. And I listened and then I crawled out of my blanket, my, my blankie, and stuck my head out. And then I stick my head out. It would stop. And I went back there and I got all curled up, and as soon as I curled up, it would start again. And it did, it just kept on going. I did it one more time, and it stopped. I said, well, I'm, I'm, I'm losing my mind. And I, I, so I laid down, and curled up as close as I could to keep myself warm, because I was wet off, all right to the skin then. The sleep was hitting me hard, it was hitting me in the face, and I covered up with my helmet. And the music kept on going. And I says, I know what it is. We were told what's happening when you're freezing to death. It says, you think you are comfortable because I was warm. I was comfortable. I was warm all over. I, had, I know my head, my face was flushed. It was so pleasant. And I said in my prayers, it says, I know I'm dying. And I thought I'm dying. So that's, you ask, did I have a good luck thing? That's my good luck thing. So it, it had to be a good luck. But anyway, that's a true story. And, I uh, I don't think a lot of people don't answer, you know, don't believe. I don't tell to me that too many people. I don't think, oh, like that. that can't happen. But it did happen. Because I heard that music, and I might have been out of my mind, but it was my music. And I, I enjoyed it. And I slept. I knew, I said, well, this is the way we were told we're freezing to death. I'm going to die. And I just laid there. I was just so happy. I, that was the happiest I've been since I was in Europe. I laid there, and I was just so happy. And then somebody had to shake me out of my dream <laughs> and to go forward. <laughs> that, that's a true, true story. So it's nothing, but to me it was something. So I mean, I didn't save anybody's life. I didn't, I didn't kill anybody. 
but I still I still believe that it was true. And I, uh, and I still have that that rosary, and to this day, Alice, my wife, and I say that rosary every day. We have ever since we've been married, not today. So merely be, merely because of that too, because she was she believed me. So that's it. So so be it. Thank you for joining me. <laughs> Thank you for joining me. Oh my. I'm so sorry. Oh. I've got clicked myself. <laughs> Forgive me. No. I'm sorry. Thank but you, there's, sir. There's so many things. Oh, I might mention to get a little bit a little happier then. We were in a, in a Jeep running, checking some uh, telephone wire that was shorted out. And there was a dead, dead, there was a soldier laid in the ditch waving at us. And we come to a halt. And he was a young guy. He probably, maybe younger than I was. And I felt like maybe 19 years old or something. A little red-headed guy, little, he was a good size boy. I mean, he was a, he was a grown man. Was, it was, couldn't move. He was in the ditch. He'd been shot. He had stomach, through the stomach. Because part of his stomach was laying out in his head. And, one of the guys, we, we did, we, got, we brought him out, put him on, on the ground, up out of his ditch. And one of the guys says, put the gun to right there, shall I shoot him? No, 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 he's not gonna hurt you. He says, put him on the top of the Jeep. So we did, put him on top of the Jeep, and we went hunting for our medical division. We'd have a tent set up someplace. We knew just follow us. We found him. They were in a little, little grocery store that used to be a grocery store, and, and we carried him in, set him in a corner, and I went looking for the doctor, and I brought him over there. He said, I'm not gonna take care of a German. I said, you take care of a German. And I pointed the gun at him. He says, okay. He says, when we get our men done, we said, I got my hands full, so we get them done, we'll take care of him. So to this day, I think of it often, did he ever get home? I like to know him. So that, that, that's a true story too. So, so little things are true that are, that it bends into us. Every GI has those stories that they only think back. Some of the things that are worthwhile. Oh, I can tell you some that wasn't worthwhile too, but they're not, that bad. they're not bad or dirty. I mean, they're, they're just not worthwhile to mention because everybody would have the same thing. You made a difference. We were we were scared. We were scared. I was scared about we. I wasn't worried about anybody else. I was worried about me. I mean, I'm sorry to say it. I was very selfish. But we ate pretty good. We come into a farm. A farm would have eggs, chickens. We have fresh eggs. We boil some, put them in our pocket, eat them for the next three or four days. You know, crack a boiled egg, a salt shaker. Well, that 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 luxury. So it, uh, what else about the eight? There's something I want to say that was funny though. Oh, phooey. Part of it. Anyway, meanwhile, back at the ranch, tell me how you came to write your book. How I did? My daughter insisted that I did. I forget what date that was. She was an adult daughter at that time. And that's why I didn't have a lot of details. Some of the things I had in here overlapped things that this here shows by the map. You know, well, this, uh, though I did, I said I didn't want to write any bloods and guts on this because all my grandchildren do, the, do read it, and they do. And uh, I, that's, that's what happened. And I started, just as the thought came down, I kept writing it down, then I was going to type it out. And my, wife, uh, my daughter said, no, no, just leave it alone the way it is. Is it better the way it is than it would be typed? And I'm glad she did because it's, and some of the words are misspelled because I tried to write so fast because my memory is already beginning to fade away. And now I thought when I get to the end of the halfway, I said, what was I going to write over here? And I, so that, that was, the stories do overlap. And this year it had these towns that we had taken all the way from La Harve, all the way to Chemnitz, Germany, and uh, Nuremberg. Uh, Nuremberg was a godsend there because the war was over and we were in Erlangen. Oh, it's one story about Erlangen. I got to tell you before anything, you never take anything. But anyway, we used to go to the, the Red Cross had already had donut place in Nuremberg and we went there and there was only 14 of us left in our company because the rest were sent to Japan or had more points than we had to come home. 
I was 14 and I was the highest ranking, so I was in charge of the motor pool, I was in charge of everything. We had nothing to be in charge of. So I, I had it easy. So we about three times a day we go to Nuremberg to the Red Cross coffee place there. And they'd see us coming up the hill and they'd have the coffee on the doors already before we walked in the door there. They knew we were coming in. They see us coming. Red Cross girls, I'm talking about. So they were American girls. So I don't know, we came there for the donuts or for the girls. But both of them worked out pretty good. <laughs> but anyway, in Erlangen, we were set out in the sun because it was still cold. I don't know if it was uh, October or something like that. But anyway, we see figures coming at us. Then there was three figures. And the first one, there were three Russians coming across the Elbe River. That was before the, uh, the Berlin Wall was built. And they had the, we were stopped right there because Russians were supposed to capture the Elbe River. That was the closest to uh, the capital. So fine, that's a great place, but we had, we had a picnic there. I could tell you more on that picnic bed, but this one here is what I want to show you, and then I want to show you the results. These Russians came over, one was on a horse, the next one was on a bicycle, the next one rode a cow. They were in line, you know, one after another. Of course, the cow was the slower than the bicycle and the horse, you know, so <laughs> he was on the cow. And they'd come up there, and they were speaking Russian, and we were speaking English there, and we almost got into a fight because there was a Sherman tank that was sitting right next to the bed, damn, it, blowing up, in fact, it was burnt. And we asked him, but how they liked it, because we knew that they had our Sherman tanks. They thought, we give you our Sherman tank. Those are our tanks. We gave them to you. And we almost got into another war. And then one of them stepped out and said, ah, pull out a bottle of vodka. And he, he poured out, yes, so for him, now he said, pointed my canteen, and I put it out. And I, I said, stop, well, he almost filled it back up. And he did the other, other, other three guys. So we downed that, and we talked and talked and talked. And we talked about, he started to talk about his papa and his, his, and his mama. He, says he didn't know where they were at. And I pulled out my wallet and I had my mother's picture and I had two of Alice's pictures. Of course, she was still in high school. She was a year behind me. So they, that was it. So she was a year younger than I was. But she had her class picture and it, it, uh, it was nice. And he was impressed. And he got, I, I had enough. Vodka and me, that I accepted anything he would say. He wanted to take them back and paint them. He wanted to paint them, you know, paint, 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 paint. He knew how to say paint. So I said, yeah, yeah, you know, okay. And I gave them to him there. And, and uh, I, I went in and got another box of uh, K rations to give him. I only had one box of K rations. I gave him one box. I had to split amongst the three. But he, I, about three days later, I said, I shouldn't have done that. I said, that vodka is doing me wrong. I, that, 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 that is a killer. Because I missed the pictures. I look at that three or four times a day. So all of a sudden, here he comes on his horse. And he came up to it by himself. He had those pictures. You want to see them? Yes. Yeah. I was shocked. I was shocked to see you, didn't you? Go back this way. Oh, come on. I'm a little shaken here that I don't know where about it's at. So we're on a remarkable like 67 years. Oh, this is the picture I had at Luxembourg, Luxembourg City. Mm -hmm. We met, or I met my outfit at uh, Boppard, which is near St. Gore on the Rhine River. This is the picture I had taken there at one of the photo shops. Very handsome man. Yeah. So you see, I I had whiskers there. I don't even look real close. I got a Hitler mustache. <laughs> I when I got back, I said, "This is silly." I shaved that in a hurry. I said, "I don't like that." I I, I wish I had done that. I I I wipe that out if I knew how. But I didn't want to ruin the picture. So that 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 thing that's me. There, in fact, he painted my mother. Here's my uh, oh. picture I had of my mother. He painted that. The not Russian that, soldier. Not bad, is it? It's beautiful. See that? See that? Yeah. And there's Alice. That's what there's well, it's very faint. This here stayed pretty good. This one here, see how faint it is? And I got one more here. There's another one. 
from this picture here. Do I have one more? I don't think I do one more. No. Maybe, no, yeah, well, I had three, but once my mother had two vowels. And I just uncovered this one right here. This one here, I got in, enlarged, and another one, I forget what it was, I got the picture on, it's been my wall for 50 years, my office wall, in a big size, and this right here. So that's that's she, and that's where I lived, and she was there, and she was what, in a senior in high school when that was taken. So, And there was my sister and her sister, and this, that's it. So, so we, we had a close close family. So her family was easy to work with. They were, they were beautiful people. And they kept the anyway, fire that's, burning for you. That, uh, that's that's the best one. Yes, that and that too. So, uh, this is also my hat. That that you see there and this one here is my mine. Mr. Antonacci, thank you for your service. Well, I did nothing. I came home. <laughs> I was scared of them. I, I, I went to my dad as a carpenter. My dad was a contractor, and I learned by digging footings. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I knew how to dig pots of them. So there you go. I appreciate yeah. it very much. Yeah. Sorry, uh, sorry, sorry I went off, off on a tangent. I should not have done that. I didn't, I didn't intend to. But, uh, That's what we're here for. Yeah. So did you want to take a picture? I don't know if it would be for the route that we took. I don't know if that would be good. I, I got the front of the book. Is there anything that you want specifically? I don't know. You see that little church there? It looks almost like uh, we were going to church there. Well, let's see here. Moselle, this is the route. I'm going to go home and pray the rosary tonight. I know. Oh, bless your heart, you. I'll go home and cry. If I don't cry here, then I'm a softie. You know, there's Boppert here. See where we cross the Rhine River? Mm -hmm. And it's right here, and that's where I met my outfit. They're going to come kick us out of the room. Here we are at Little Harm, and this route all the way through here. That's where we started, going through here, and then through here. Moselle River, Luxembourg, and St. Hubert was, it. oh, there was, we met a little lady, or she met us, we were looking at a tank that had been blown out. The 101 had a Sherman tank that had blown up, and we were looking at it, to see, just looking at it. A little lady coming this way here. She had a basket full of sticks that she got out of the forest, and, uh, she spoke fairly broken English, and she, we, we understood what you were saying. She invited her into her little house, which is not maybe 100 feet away from there, to sit down and get warm by her little pot belly stove. And she mixed up some tea for us. We sat down, five of us, said. and she made the tea. What would we do? We each pulled out a tea ration, each gave one. I pulled out an next one. She had four and stacked them right there. So when we left, we seen this tree that she got there and it blasted by a shell. So one of the guys was a farmer and he, he knew how to use an axe. So he said, let's take some of this back and chop it and put it on our back porch. That way we lugged it all back there. He chopped it all up there and stacked it up on her back porch and we left. And that was it. So I said, that, that's St. Hubert. That's the middle of uh, Luxembourg. 